All right, what's new with agency? Um, I'm not going to turn this into the residential standard agency course. I've taught that till I'm green. Um, <clears throat> but what I do want to talk to you about is recent action by the real estate board. In fact, it was just week before last that the real estate board uh, formally approved um, in their August meeting, I mean their September meeting, a guidance document to resolve a difference of opinion, dispute, call it what you want, but a, but a pretty serious difference in interpretation of the new statute um, that was uh, creating a lot of confusion, a lot of confusion. Uh, the way it was resolved I think is a very satisfactory resolution, but one that has its own hair on it. <laughs> uh, I think the board's action was pretty, pretty well considered. But in order for us to understand what went into that guidance document, how many of you have seen the guidance document? By, other than it's just an appendix to what I handed out to what was handed out today. Okay. Uh, how many of you have actually read it? How many of you? understood at all what it was trying to do. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> you teach the class. All right. You've got it attached to your outline, right? <clears throat> all right, read with me. No. No. Put it away. But keep it and read it after we, you know, have it available for us to look at because I'll refer to a couple things on it. But what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the context in which this very important issue was resolved by the board, or at least the board gave us its thinking about enforcement issues. The statute that was enacted in, 2000, in the 2011 legislature uh, what, that was a change to the agency statutes enacted in 19, originally in 1995 had two basic provisions that come into play here. One of them was that all brokerage agreements have to be in writing. All brokerage agreements have to be in writing. And the others have to do with the definitions that apply to brokerage agreements, brokerage relationships, customers and the other things that had been a part of the definitions of uh, the statute since it was enacted in 1995. Some of those provisions went into effect in 2011. Some had a delayed effectiveness of 2012, July 1st of this year. The, the requirement that brokerage agreements be in writing went into effect July 1st of this year. Definitional changes went into effect last year. All right. Now, one way of thinking about this is that the only thing that changed was that, in, in this regard, there are other changes to the statute, but in this regard was that if you entered into an agreement with your client whereby your client was hiring you to represent the client, that can no longer be done on a handshake or through the use of some disclosure document, as, as has been pretty customary and pretty common, that you had to have a formal written brokerage agreement, although it didn't have to be complicated. <laughs> right? It really only had to have three or four things. What am I going to do for you? How long is our relationship going uh, to last or how will it end? How much am I going to get paid? That's essentially it. You know, what do I do? When will it start and end? How will I get paid? Now, nothing was said in the changes about how detailed you had to be in any of these categories. Nothing was said that if you have a brokerage relationship, you have to do a minimum of these services and these services, or it has to be a certain length of time, or it can't be less than this. Nothing about that. So it could be for one hour, and you do nothing but open a door and you don't get paid. 
but it has to be in writing and signed by the parties. All right, now, here's where the, uh, the spam hit the fan. <coughs> the statute also goes to some length, and the, the educational materials went to some length, to articulate a difference that the, uh, the, that the folks that set up this, uh, the educational regime and trained the trainers on this uh, thought really needed to be emphasized. And that was the difference between a brokerage relationship, a customer relationship, or the different types of brokerage relationships. So there was a lot of emphasis. How many of you, by the way, have taken the uh, RSA course? What's that, maybe 15, 20%? Uh, you notice um, how the emphasis was placed on, or there was a great deal of emphasis on this independent contractor relationship, okay? I can't say that I really 100% understand exactly why there was so much emphasis on that. but. I think it's because there was this feeling that with brokerage agreements needing to be in writing and because of the um, uh, renewed interest in formalities of relationships that it might be useful for some people to shift from a typical agency kind of relationship to a contractual relationship of a different type, an independent contractor relationship. Not really sure, but let's just summarize what we've got and then we'll get to the, to the problem. In Virginia, it is and has been clear ever since the 95 Act, but long before that, because the 95 Act didn't change anything except some terminology, that there are essentially two ways that you can deal with clients if you're a real estate licensee. You can have a relationship that grows out of this thing we call agency, which is a special kind of relationship. Um, an agency relationship has features that no other kind of relationship has, um, or that are special. And what is the special nature of agency? That when the client hires the agent, the client is saying to the agent, I hire you to act on my behalf. All right. So what you do is done as if I did it. And therefore, if you do something wrong, you subject me to liability. If you make a misrepresentation, it can cost me my contract, although I never made a misrepresentation. You are my voice. What you do is binding on me. You act subject to my instructions. But what you do is binding on me. I give you my power in a way. Now, agency relationships are very useful. If I don't have the time or expertise or the willingness to undertake something, I want somebody to do it for me, to undertake it on my behalf. And I want them to be able to bind me by their actions. That can have a very special benefit to me, but it also has the drawbacks of my being bound by what the, that person does. That's the unique thing about an agency relationship, that I give the power to act on my behalf to somebody else. Now, that's not the way we do most of our dealings. Most of our dealings in this world, um, in our day-to-day -day lives and in our business relationships, the vast majority of them are done pursuant to a very different kind of relationship that we for better, uh, just because of it, it, it's a term of art, is an independent contractor relationship. Where I hire you to do something for me, but not to act on my behalf, not to represent me to other people, not to bind me in your dealings with third parties. I hire you to do something that our contract sets out that you're going to do for me. You do it, and I pay you. That's it. You are not free to speak on my behalf to other people, to third parties. You don't bind me by what you do with other parties. So think of all the ways in which we act with independent contractor relationships. We'll name something that you ever hire somebody to do. 
General contractor. A contractor, I mean, to build onto your house. Somebody that washes your car, somebody that does your taxes, somebody that landscapes your, your lawn. The thousands of things that we hire people to do are typically done or services are provided pursuant to an independent contractor relationship. There's nothing special about it. It's the most common thing in the world. Well, why couldn't I hire you as a licensee to list my house or help me find a property pursuant to the terms of an agreement that you and I work out? And I deny you the authority to act on my behalf or to bind me by your actions with third parties. Couldn't we do that? Sure. Happens all the time. In the commercial world, it is routine. Independent contractor relationships in the commercial brokerage world are the norm. Agency relationships are relatively less frequent. And one of the reasons is that there's something about agency that has a certain risk associated with it. If you want some third party to act on your behalf or speak for you, fine. But if you don't, maybe you're better off without it. Now this has been the case forever. Nothing changed in 1995 with the new Broker Act. Um, um, we've always been able to, to differentiate between the types of relationships we enter into. And think about how relatively few agency relationships we ever have. Pretty few, right? Uh, think about typical agency relationships. Um, A-Rod hired an agent to negotiate with George Steinbrenner. <laughs> Tiger Woods has an agent that helps him with his PR or ad campaigns. <laughs> they've, they've been fired. No. <laughs> I might hire an agent uh, to help me sell my antique cars. You know, there are a lot of th things that we may hire agents to do, employment and, and advertising and PR and so on, all right? But most of the things that we do are not in the agency realm. It's a special kind of relationship. In 95, we even asked the question, do we even want agency relationships? And the answer from the membership was, because in those days, agency and not understanding it got us in a lot of trouble. <laughs> uh, that the statute was supposed to clarify for us, okay, to make it easier for us to do business. Our membership decided we do like the specialness and the proximity that it brings to our client of an agency relationship, so we have it. The statute basically said, look, if you're going to act as a listing agent on behalf of a client, here are some things that you're obligated to do. And they just pull straight in from the common law the things that you would ordinarily do as a listing agent. And you read the list of things, it's just like the statute had never been written, it's just, oh, we decided to write these down in a, a single place so you could have easy reference. That's really what the statute was. And if you did these things, or if you did not make a special effort to differentiate, you were considered to be an agent and you were considered to be a standard agent. That was the name we gave it, just standard agency. Uh, over the years we added a new, uh, the market added and we incorporated into the statute a special kind of agency relationship that we called limited service agency or brokerage where we were hiring you not to do the full plate of services that a standard agent would do but a more limited uh, plate of services, perhaps put it in the MLS, help us with disclosures, but we'll negotiate, we'll take offers, we'll deliver them and so on. You get a reduced fee for reduced service. All right. So the way it came to be is that we have three kinds of agency relationships. I mean three kinds of brokerage relationships. You can be hired by a, a client to act as your agent, in which case you are either a standard agent or a limited service agent. Or you can hire the licensee in an independent contractor relationship. Something different. These are not the services we want that the statute imposes by default. We prefer a different kind of relationship or at least we don't want this unique thing called agency. We may ask you to do everything that the statute requires and more, but we're not hiring you as our agent. Okay? So pretty simple. Agency or non-agency? Agency or independent contractor? And if you are an agent, you can either be a standard agent or limited service agent. Okay? So three types of brokerage relationships. Standard agency, limited service, independent contractor. Got it? Pretty simple. Well, these are brokerage relationships. 
if you enter into any of these, now, according to the new statute, has to be in writing. So the question becomes, what does it take to create a brokerage relationship? Right? Well, you sign a contract. No, no, no. That begs the question. It puts forth something you assume in order to prove what you're trying to prove. Uh-uh. A brokerage agreement results from what? Uh, excuse me, a brokerage relationship results from what? Well, let's, how about this? How about we go to the statute and see how the definitions work? Definitions work pretty straightforwardly. You ready? A brokerage relationship is the relationship between a client and a licensee whereby the client engages the licensee to procure a buyer, seller, tenant, landlord, option, etc. Ready, willing, and able to deal on terms acceptable to the client. In other words, you hire me to represent you in dealings with someone else. Procuring a buyer, seller, etc. All right? Ready, willing, and able to deal. Well, what does it take to make a brokerage relationship? We take one step back. A brokerage <laughs> agreement. You look at the definition of a brokerage agreement, and it is an agreement now in writing which creates a brokerage relationship. Okay? There you are. That brokerage agreement now must be in writing. But what does it create? A brokerage relationship. What is that? Where I hire you, I engage you to procure for me a buyer, seller, etc., willing and able to deal with me on terms that are agreeable to me. Okay? So, suppose I come to you, hypothetically, I come to you and I say, I'm moving to the area. We're being relocated to Tidewater and <coughs> my wife and I are coming down and we make a, an appointment to meet with you and we say, we're moving down here, we're going to relocate in six months or four months, whatever, and we are here to learn about the area. Never been here before. Here's real nice. We know nothing about what's available down here, what values are. We don't know the area, so we don't know where we want to live compared to where we're going to work, etc. We would like, you came highly recommended to us by a mutual colleague, and so we've been, you've been recommended. We'd like to talk to you to uh, help us learn about the area. Okay, you say. You've had this happen. Not as much as you would like, maybe, but <laughs> but when it happens, what do you do? Okay, well, that's fine, uh, but first you have to sign this agreement with me. Now, how many of you would that be the first thing you would do? No, of course not. You're sitting there faced with what? What would you? What do you call these people? Prospect. A prospect. And what do you need to do with a prospect? You have to earn their business. Oh, you wouldn't think that, according to our traditional way of looking at working with buyers. Sure, come on, let me, let me show you around. We didn't need to have, have anything formalized. We certainly never got anything in writing. But now, see, we've got to have these brokerage relationships that arise from brokerage agreements in writing. So what is it that we're going to be able to do with these people? So let's continue the conversation. You're, you're sitting there, and the conversation is, well, I would be happy. I do appreciate that Mary gave you our name. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, here's my experience. Here's what I know about the area. Here's the type of things that I do. I work with many buyers. I have uh, familiarity with lots of different loan programs, can introduce you to lenders. I know the full slate of uh, service providers that would be useful to you, from home inspections to attorneys to handle closings or settlement agents, uh, surveyors. Uh, you name it, but especially I know the neighborhoods that have the types of properties that you have expressed an interest in, the price range. Now, I also understand that you won't have any idea what your money can buy down here, except the most remote kinds of looks that you may have done on, online. 
and you don't have you won't know the neighborhoods that are suitable to you so let's talk a little bit about when you want to move what your needs are regarding schools etc cetera, etc cetera. and how are you going to finance this are you going to need to sell your home first have you lined that up where do you stand what is your time frame what are you looking for etc I want to know about you because I can't help you unless I do but I want you to know about me so here's about me all right now let me just make an observation here and this happens too seldom in my opinion what I just described to you that takes place over perhaps an hour or maybe even more is sort of the counterpart to a listing presentation isn't it but now you're dealing with a prospect who's a buyer and not a seller but what are you doing you're selling yourself you're developing a relationship you're showing that you want to know these people's needs you want to know about them and you're not prepared to do thing one until you do know what you need to know to make an educated uh, evaluation of their needs and, and uh, give them suggestions. And in the process, you're trying to gain their confidence so they will feel comfortable hiring you. Now, I don't think that's the way most people approach the typical buyer who comes in their path. It's much more truncated, at least it has been in the past, because we have never needed to do anything formal. So you spend some time you help them locate property and if a deal results you get paid whether you had anything formalized with them or not is pretty much irrelevant being the procuring cause is completely independent of any kind of agency relationship you just have to begin that chain of events that leads to procuring a deal and if you do you get paid and furthermore any kind of listing agent knows what he's doing doesn't give a rip what your relationship with the buyer is at all <laughs> send me a sell uh, send me a buyer that's all I care about it can be any relationship you choose or none I just want you to send me a deal all right so in the past we've been pretty blase about it but you're taking a mature approach to gain the confidence of these people because you know what you know that now the law requires them to enter into a written agreement with you and they're not going to do that just simply at the drop of a hat they didn't have to before so whether this relationship grew out of a mutual understanding, somebody's under, uh, intent, somebody's voiced desire or a written agreement, didn't matter. As long as you acted consistently with the interest of these buyers and didn't violate any duty you had to a seller, written agreement or no, didn't matter. But now it makes all the difference. Because if you cross into the world of a brokerage relationship, it must be on paper now. So wisely approached, we anticipate and do what we should have been doing all along anyway earning the confidence and faith of these people by a mature professional presentation akin to what we would do or analogous to what we would do if we were trying to get a listing uh, but this isn't your day despite your best efforts <coughs> despite your best efforts you get through the end, you've talked and talked and talked, and you've shared information and you've developed a rapport, and you think you have a pretty good relationship, it's gone very well. And you say, our company's, uh, our, our company's uh, distinct preference in a case like this is that we act on your behalf, that, we, that you hire us, and we hope you will agree to hire us to help you accomplish your goal. Virginia law now requires that when you do we must enter into a written agreement it can be simple doesn't have to be lengthy or any particular time we can discuss how we'll get paid but you do have a mature discussion about how you get paid it's just you know it can be fairly simple well Jane thank you we've been very impressed we like what we hear but we hope you'll understand that we are not ready to hire an agent yet. We fully expect that we will. Our goal in this trip to Tidewater is to learn about the area, to see what is what, what will our money buy, what kind of neighborhoods are best suited for us. We want to talk to people about schools. Um, we want to get a sense of the culture and what's available and where it's located we just want an idea of where we want to live compared to where we work and so on okay 
<clears throat> and we wanted to meet you. But we're not prepared at this time to formalize a relationship. We hope you understand. We anticipate that that may very well come. We like what we've seen so far. So I'm sorry, we're, we're not prepared to enter into a, an agreement with you today. However, we would very much like you to identify some neighborhoods for us and perhaps show us some houses. <laughs> Yeah, the question is, you've had a lot of a conversation here about lots of things that are personal and uh, financial in nature, perhaps, and even confidential. Uh, why is it that you have not crossed the line into a brokerage relationship by having the conversation? Well, let's go back to the definition. A brokerage relationship occurs when a client hires a licensee for the, to engage that person for the purpose of procuring a transaction with a buyer, seller, etc., willing and able to deal on terms acceptable to the seller or to your client. All right. There has to be a hiring for the purpose of obtaining a transaction with somebody willing to deal with me. Now, let me just turn around and ask you this. Suppose you made the counterpart presentation to a seller in which you talked about all kinds of confidential stuff. Would you have to get something in writing before they signed the listing? You know, that was one of the things that was, that somebody insisted be put in this guidance document. I could not, I could hardly even believe my, all right. We're coming to that because this is a bizarre sort of, this, this goes in a, in a very interesting path. Let's put it this way. And parts of it were almost it was a little bit surreal, all right. But now wait a minute, if, if you're having these conversations with a seller, all right, so suppose you're having these with a buyer. Does it mean that you have created a brokerage relationship by your conversation? That's that reality. Very few of these conversations are linear. Right. have all kinds of twists and turns and sure. dead ends and cross streets in the road. And oh, by the way, you've got my sister who's also on the pipe. Da-da-da-da-da-da. <laughs> and at some point, you're way on the deep end of the road. And even with the guidelines, I feel like you're in the, in the, the DMZ. Right. Yeah, the question is, these conversations go in all kinds of directions, and it's easy to get into the thicket, even with guidance. Correct. So what I want to do is just set a scenario that while it doesn't happen every day, certainly not bizarre, it didn't fall off the moon, that people are moving here and talk to you, and you try to sell yourself to them, and they say, listen, I'm not ready to formalize anything with you, but I would like you to help me learn a little bit about the neighborhood. And you say to yourself, well, yeah, I can either say no, you're not ready to sign on the dotted line, therefore go find somebody else, or you can say this is a good prospect. And yes, I am willing to spend some time with this prospect in the hope of getting business from this prospect. All right. All right, the question is, may you? All right, now, hold on. The position that was taken, the position that was taken by some people was that you could not give any information to this couple, could not show them a property, could not do anything for which you had to be licensed without first obtaining a formal written agreement from them. And the theory ran this way, and this was actually articulated, it was put in writing, that in order to provide a licensed activity, you must have a license. In other words, you can't show, in other words, a, a, an assistant, unlicensed assistant can't show a house because showing a house is a licensed activity. You must have a license in order to provide a licensed activity. Number two, brokerage relationships must be in writing. Number three, Therefore, all activities for which a license is required require a written brokerage agreement. Now, if 
you missed the syllogism there, so did I. A plus B equals C, 2A plus 2B equals 2C. You know, there's certain, but you have to have a license to do a licensed activity. Brokerage relationships or brokerage agreements have to be in writing. Therefore, any licensed activity has to be done within a brokerage relationship. I didn't see the, the, that it followed. Okay. Now, what we, what we began to see was that, for example, somebody says, look, I'm not really necessarily in the mood to, I don't know that I, I want to buy right now, but I sure am interested in this market. It's doing all kinds of funky stuff. And I think the more you know, the better. I saw a couple of properties that you know may be of interest to me, but I just kind of want to get some information. Can you show me this house over here, Joe? These two foreclosures that are on the market. Can you show me those? I don't know that I want to do anything. I certainly am not ready to do anything this minute, but I sure would like to get to know something. Can you just show me those? No, I'm sorry. You have to first sign a written brokerage agreement with me, and then I can show you. Well, what does this brokerage agreement have to say? What I'm going to do for you, I just want you to show them these houses. Okay, show you the house. How long is it going to last? 30 minutes? And uh, what am I going to pay you? Nothing? Okay. But you have to put that in a written brokerage agreement and get it signed. All right. <clears throat> um, and so the question is, and it became very simply, do all licensed activities, or must all licensed activities be performed only within the confines of a written, executed brokerage agreement with the person who has now become your client? Or not. <laughs> All right. Now the position, certain position, well look, let's not beat around the bush. VAR took the position that you had to have a formal written brokerage agreement. It didn't have to be complicated just had to meet the definitions or, or the requirements of the statute before you could pr perform any licensed activity. Uh, and I, I first got wind of this from questions that I got from some brokers in different parts of the state who, like me, had been through the train the trainer uh, sessions back at the end of last year. And during those sessions, this was not part of the training that we got, or at least it wasn't part of what I got in December of last year. Um, and this emerged somewhat later in the spring uh, and, and throughout the spring I began to hear people say that now the materials on the VAR website and in their webinar that they did statewide and uh, in the written materials they were handing out and certainly in the programs that, that uh, VAR and the people uh, using the VAR training materials were teaching was that every licensed activity required a formal brokerage agreement in writing before they could be performed. There's a lot of uh, a lot of questions about this around the state, and I started getting some calls and questions. I remember I was at an ethics hearing uh, for the you know, to advise the panel on a kind of a messy case. It was a messy, messy case, and they just the local association asked me to come in and and advise them as the the thing went on. And the person who was chairing the panel that day took me aside before it was over and said, "Hey, have you heard?" Um, about the interpretation that some are putting on this statute so we don't see it. We're not, and I got a call from large companies in the Tidewater area, for example, who said, we're not sure we see the connection. Brokerage agreements result, our brokerage relationships result from agreements whereby the client hires you for the purpose of doing something set out in the statute, which is procuring other parties to deal with you on terms that you all agree on. It's not identifying a property, for example. It says to procure other parties to deal with you. Now, there's something about that that suggests, although I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, a transaction. You know, a dealing between two people or two parties. And to, to do otherwise would require, for example, this person that I described, and by the way, the conversation that I gave you, the introduction, came straight out of the mouth of a broker in Northern Virginia. For a company I do a lot of work for, when I was helping train them on the new agency law, uh, not giving the RSA program, which I did for their, it's a big company, I did four programs for their company, 
and it was right in the middle of this dispute that was going on over what the statute meant. And it was creating a lot of confusion. But at one point I'd been up there to talk to their uh, managers, they have about 20 offices, and they were trying to implement procedures and so on to be sure that they complied with the law and not only just told their agents, well, if you've got a brokerage agreement, you've got to have it in writing. Frankly, the deal there is buyers, right? We always get listings in writing. We get property management agreements in writing. We do relatively little tenant relationship work. It's buyers that matter, right? That's our, that's our, uh, our concern here. And they just wanted to be sure that they had the right procedures in place. And one of the things we talked about was, look, it's not enough just to tell your agents, okay, if you have an agreement with your buyer that you're gonna represent the buyer, you gotta get it in writing, and then turn and say, have fun getting them. <laughs> no, we need to train on two things. How you convince people to enter into agreements with you, to hire you, and what can you do if you don't get hired? What are your limits? Well, it was about this time that we had, the, um, we had the, this friction arise, such that some were saying, your limits are complete. You have total limit. You can do nothing if they don't hire you. And others, uh, others of us thought that that was, uh, that was not correct, that it was too far, it went too far. There were limits imposed, but not on all licensed activities. The definition of a brokerage relationship did not say the agreement between a client and um, the person who hires the client, whereby the client hires the licensee to provide any licensed activity. Now, if that had been the way the statute had read, I would have had no problem saying, that's a brokerage relationship. It's created by a brokerage agreement. The brokerage agreement must be in writing. Before you provide any licensed activity, you must have a brokerage relationship and an agreement in writing. But it's a different definition, definition than just any licensed activity. Uh, or at least in some people's minds it was. In others, it equated. All right. Well, at the time I was speaking to these folks uh, in Northern Virginia, this dispute had not arisen. This is back in the spring. And I remember the, the broker saying, look, you know, we were talking about how do you convince buyers to enter into agreements with you? See, we got a problem. For the, first, the first problem is we haven't conditioned buyers to sign agreements. Sellers are, uh, are accustomed to signing agreements. You don't have any problem convincing a seller to sign a listing. Your problem is convincing them to sign a listing with you. <laughs> but when a seller decides to sell a house and you ask them, are you going to balk at signing a listing agreement? You don't get one in a million that says, oh yeah, I don't think I'm going to sign a listing agreement with anybody. I don't know, sir. <laughs> then you're not going to sell your house, so you're going to be a FISBO if you are, right? Uh, I'm going to use a broker, but I'm not signing a listing is something you don't ever hear. But we heard it all the time with buyers, didn't we? All the time. I don't need to sign an agreement with a buyer agent or with a broker or an agent that I'm going to uh, use to help me find a property. I don't have to do that. And frankly, you didn't. Well, they weren't used to signing agreements. They better get used to signing agreements. And how do we do that? We better get them used to signing agreements. See, I think it's a folly for us to say this, or to us to take this approach. Uh, <clears throat> look, I'd be happy to work with you. But the law says I, ha I, I can do that only with a written agreement with you. You know, I don't think I'm ready to sign a written agreement with you. I don't know anything about you. You haven't shown me anything. You haven't talked to me about anything. You just said, let's go look at some houses. Okay. Look, everybody else is going to require you to sign something, so you might as well sign it with me. <laughs> Try that at your next listing presentation. <laughs> hey, look, you're just going to have to sign it with him down the street, so you might as well sign it with me. No, that's not how you get a listing and you know it. And that's not how you get a buyer either. So what was this woman saying in this, in this conversation we were having? She said, she was saying what I have preached for years, and many of you have heard me say it, that we don't treat our buyers with the same respect and deference and professionalism that we bring to bear with a prospective seller trying to get a listing. 
we go loaded for bear to sell ourselves, to commit, and to ask for a commitment. We don't typically do that with buyers, but we haven't had to. And now we're reaping the rewards of ignoring relationships with buyers. Well, this woman said that she had that presentation with these folks. They were from Ohio, and they were coming to Northern Virginia. And she said, they, she went through this whole thing. She said, I teach my agents, and I have good luck getting them to get buyer agency agreements in writing, and always have, but it takes them a while, because they have to learn just the way you have to learn to make a listing presentation. Nobody's great at listing presentations at the beginning. You get better over time because you have to do them each and every time you take a listing. So she says, each and every time my people work with buyers, I tell them to go through this same process, whether it results in a written agreement or not at the end is not the point. The point is it imparts this sense of I'm, I respect you and I want to earn your respect. And I want you to know that I'm professional in the way I approach my business. All right? But now it's essential if we're going to have the end result of a written agreement. If we think that all we have to do is say, listen, you've got to sign a written agreement with whoever you work with, we're nuts. If we took that approach to sellers, it wouldn't work. And if we take it with buyers, I'm afraid there's more options, there are more options for buyers out there than there are for sellers. The MLS is largely for sellers. Buyers have a wealth of ways to find information about available properties other than the MLS or other than the realtor that they work with. And so if we don't earn their business and we think that that just means they're going to just default to doing what sellers do, we're nuts. That's not why sellers do it. They hire us because they, they trust us and buyers need to do the same. But what can you do if they won't? This woman said she made this pitch to these people and she said it was the pitch of a lifetime. Expensive house they were talking about. And she knew that this could be a good client and prob probably one that she could build relationships with and get referrals and all that. And they said, no, listen, we are not ready to do this. We fully expect that we will and we very much expect that it will be with you, but we are not here to hire an agent this week. But we would like you to help us get some information. All right, we are at ground zero. The AR's opinion was she had to say no. Many other people said she does not have to say no, as long as she is careful about what she does. But that once you have asked to be hired and been told no, I'm not going to hire you, you have made a prima facie case that there is no brokerage relationship. <laughs> Because a brokerage relationship is defined by the act of the customer or the client hiring you to represent them in dealings with another person. Well, query, could she then introduce them to properties and neighborhoods and give them an idea of values and so on, what their money would buy? Yes or no? Okay, substantial number of people said no. A substantial number of people said yes. This is a problem. It doesn't matter which is right. There needs to be some understanding of what the accurate reading of the statute is. Well, I can't say because I didn't hear 100%, but I heard people tell me that they had, uh, in programs and other times, they, they were hearing things such as, you may not even respond to inquiries on your website without first having the person sign a brokerage agreement. You can't provide any information because providing information about properties is a licensed activity without first getting a brokerage agreement. There were people who questioned whether you could even do a CMA for a seller in advance of a listing presentation because that was doing an analysis for a consumer and that in order to do that and present it to them, you had to have a written brokerage agreement before you could go in and seek a written brokerage agreement. What's our problem here? Well, no, we have a bigger problem. What has happened? Well, well the threshold. What, is, what has been created here? Yeah, I mean, isn't there a brokerage relationship here? At least on, in the mind of the tenant? 
I think I've engaged this person to assist me in dealings with this landlord. If you have allowed that to happen and you have not reduced this to writing, I can tell you the board is going to take a piece out of your fanny. Now, you say, well, golly, that was unreasonable for the tenant to think that. I never led the tenant to believe that. Okay, wouldn't it have been nice for you to, given, to have given the tenant maybe a little notice that I mentioned? It's clear here that you are not hiring me to do X, Y, and Z, and it's when you have this idea that I'm going to help you in dealings with the landlord, then we have to memorialize this in writing. Well, I, I've drafted this just for company use. This is just... What form to do what? Shh. Well, you don't. Let's forget agency disclosure here. That's a totally. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, I am articulating to the tenant something that I want them to understand that we don't have a brokerage relationship of any sort. We don't have a brokerage relationship. And therefore, I'm going to be limited in what I can do. I'm not telling them who I represent. That's, you know, it's, let's, let's, let's remember, I'm not saying, hey, I represent the owner. I don't have a property even. These people haven't even identified a property. They just want help in finding information about an, about an area. So the point is, I have asked them to engage me to be their agent. They have said no. So I just say, listen. I understand. I've asked and you've said no and we respect that. I hope, well whoever it is, it could be a seller, a tenant, a landlord, it, it, it doesn't matter. Somebody comes to you and wants you to do something for them, but they don't, they resist or refuse to hire you, then, well, I think we generally want to be hired, but most of the time we're going to ask and they're going to say no is when this problem arises. So. You know, if we don't want to work with them, if they want us to be their agent and we say no, well, I don't see a big problem with that. We just stop returning their calls and so on. All right, so a buyer uh, decides they want to rent something they've seen, and so you refer to them as your client. The question is, who, who on the other side cares? No, no. I mean, who uh, uh, on the landlord side cares? Does the landlord? No, no. What is the what is the point here about about whether this is really your tenant client? Isn't the point that you want to know whether you need something in writing? Not disclosing to whom? To whom the potential tenant. That was one possibly the buyer. Yeah. And so they're trying to Well wait a minute, wait a minute. They have no disclosure obligation to a client. Except to let them know if they represent the other side. What disclosure is it that you think they should make to this buyer? The unrepresented party disclosure? You're not representing the other side in this. You have no disclosure to make. I understand that. Listen, let's put this to rest. Let's put this to rest. This is the most, look, it is, it is amazingly simple once you just follow this simple thing. This unrepresented party thing has got everybody all twisted around. It is simple. Unrepresented isn't what you disclose. It's the party to whom you make a disclosure that you work for the other guy. Look, here's the deal. I am the listing agent. Somebody calls me to see the house. 
I tell these people, I ask, are you working with another agent? No. It's my duty to let you know that I work for the seller in case there be any confusion. Right? Now, are you working with somebody else? Yes, I'm working with Long and Foster and there, uh, Susie at Long and Foster and she suggested I give you a call. Okay, fine. Do you have an agency disclosure to make? What would the disclosure be? Just, just for grins. Who can tell me what I would need to tell her about agency? That I'm not her agent? Well, she hired Long and Foster. I'm at Remax. Do I need to tell her that I represent the seller? Well, why did she call me? Why did she call me? She knew who she hired. Who did she think I was if she called my sign? Look, if she's represented... Here's a simple fact. Mark this down. In a co-broke situation, no agency disclosure is required. Ever. Period. Ever. No. No dis agency disclosure to anybody is... Dis you don't have to tell your own client. They signed a listing. You don't have to tell them that you're working for them. And now in this world, the buyer has signed a written agreement with you as well. You don't have to tell him he's, you're working for him. If he doesn't know it by the time he signed an agreement with you, we got a hopeless situation. <laughs> All you have to do is tell somebody who could be confused what the truth is. Let me give you an example. What? Oh, that's everybody in the room. Every participant in a transaction. Let me give you an example of, of perspective confusion. A buyer, is, a buyer agent is working with a buyer. There is a buyer agency agreement in writing. Decide to go look at a FISBO. Buyer agent knocks on the door, calls, writes, whatever. I'm working with a buyer who is interested in seeing your house. Mm, interesting. May I show it? Okay. If I bring you a contract, will you pay me a fee? Okay, what's reasonable? And you agree. Nothing more said. What is entirely reasonable for that seller to think just happened? He hired an agent. <laughs> I'm letting somebody show my house and I'm paying them a fee if they sell it? I think I just hired me an agent. So what must you say? Uh, listen, you have agreed to let me show your house and to pay me a fee, you need to know something important. I'm working for, this, for the buyer. I've been engaged by the buyer. I'm not working for you, I'm working for the buyer. And nobody is working for you. But if I took a buyer to see a listed property, why would I have to go out of my way to tell that seller who's never met me that I'm not working for them? They know who they listed with. But in that for sale of order, you get that in writing. You always do it in writing. Don't confuse that with a written brokerage agreement. They are completely different. Completely different. So it can't be all the questions. Oh, I'm sorry, you've had your hand up. In the example you gave, where the people say, I'm not ready to sign a brokerage agreement. At that point, but they want you to show them some things. They, can't, they drove a long way. I mean, we have this all the time. They drove a long way, and now they want to see some things. Um, would you advise that then, in order to show it, that you don't have to have them sign anything, or that they sh should be signed a non-represented party agreement? All right. Uh, you, you, we go back to our Ohio people. Yeah, and OK. Hold on. For the people who are watching this online in another room or later, the question was, people drive to the Eastern Shore and they want to see property they do not want to hire you yet. May you do it with nothing in writing or should you give them a non-disclosed party representation? All right. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Question, can't you just do a one-day grant? Absolutely. And you know what? This was one of the things that the folks at VAR said. Don't worry about it. Just get them to do a one-hour, one-day thing. Question is, some people won't sign anything. Look, again, you may always get anybody to sign anything that you're both willing to have signed. Let's go back to the threshold issue. When must you have something in writing? If the client refuses to sign, what are your limitations? Those are our issues. So yes, you may always do that. And if the client says, fine, I'm not telling anybody not to do that. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not discouraging you. By all means, 
belts, suspenders, and everything else, okay? Really, seriously. But there will be times that you will want to work with somebody as a very good prospect and they are not willing to sign the time of day. What are your limitations? That's our focus. That's our focus. And the broad answer is your limitations are those things outside of your being hired to find them sellers willing to do deals with them. And I don't know when that happens that that intent arises. But I think the board has made reasonably clear that when the client has made clear that there is no hiring for that purpose but wants to see a property, it has not yet uh, uh, come to that point. I'm not speaking for the board. I'm just telling you that I believe that absent the intent that you're engaged to, to, to procure that ready, willing, and able seller, there is no brokerage relationship. Okay. Um, now, to answer your question specifically, they don't want to do a uh, brokerage agreement, but they want you to show them properties. All right, let's assume for a minute that it's not their intent that you represent them in procuring a ready, willing, and able seller. Let's give that as a given. Show them the property, nothing need be in writing. Is everybody clear about that? Oh, all right, all right, one, one second. But as to an agency disclosure, are you representing the seller of that property? Well, if it's an MLS property, I guess it depends whether. Well, no, just as in my, in, give me a, a, a hypothetical. Yes. yes, now you have to tell these people who are not represented, by the way, that's my listing. And because then they know that you have an interest on that side of the table. Now, that was one of the things that I put in this company-specific disclosure form, which is kind of a polite way of saying to these people, listen, we're happy to work with you. We wish you would hire us, and we hope you will, but we're happy to work with you within certain limitations now. We hope you'll understand the time may come we have to come back and get something in writing. But we appreciate the chance to earn your business. All right, that's basically what it says. All right, but that is completely different from this idea that you're telling, oh, one, one thing I, I was going to say, we added to that. By the way, it, the, may, the time may come when we show you a property that we have listed, at which time, or at that time, we will give you a written disclosure of the fact that we are representing the owner of that property. And you even tell them that at some point in the future, it may be that I have to let you know, you haven't yet engaged me to work for you, but I am working for them. You always have to do that. Nothing has changed in that regard. Not a thing has changed. There are three times you have to give this disclosure of single agency, only three. A listing agent to an unrepresented buyer. Somebody walks in your open house, calls you off a sign. Find a way to tell them you work for the seller. The potted plant would know it anyway. Who do they think you are when they walk in, when they call you off a sign, but the listing agent? More importantly, a buyer agent working with a FISBO. There could seriously be a confusion if you ask to show the house and be paid a fee. They may very well think they've hired you. You better be sure they know you're working for the buyer. And finally, sub-agency. You're accepting an offer of sub-agency. You're working for the seller, but working with the buyer. And that was the whole problem in the 80s uh, that built up and exploded in the 80s, the sub-agency meltdown was all because of confusion on the part of buyers as to who selling agents worked for. They had a legal relationship with the seller, but they were acting on behalf of the buyer. Conflict, overlapping obligations, dual agencies undisclosed and consented to. Good thing about uh, sub-agency, pretty much gone. Pretty much gone. Uh, buyer agent FISBO, relatively on the rare side, happens of course, but it's not every day. And uh, listing agent unrepresented buyer, we can live with that. What's the difficulty? But those are the only times you have a single agency disclosure obligation, period. It has to be done in writing. Has to be done in writing at the first practical time, but in no event later than the time of contract or the time that assistance is given, okay? So they call you to see a house. They saw a sign. They want to see it, but first they want to know a little bit about it. Well, you don't have the price on the sign. You don't have square footage, number of bedrooms. They ask you a few questions. Uh, you know, of course, that we are the listing firm representing the seller. Well, of course, who else would have their sign in the front yard? <laughs> Just tell them. And now they say, can I go see it? Take them a form to sign. Big deal. They already knew it. 
They walk in your open house, put on your open house listing, proudly representing the owners of 123 West Elm Street, and get them to sign in. You've made the only disclosure the law requires, a written disclosure, that you represent the seller. Hi, my agent sent me here to see this house. This is wonderful, says the person walking into the open house. No disclosure required. Got it? They have an agent? The seller has the agent? Nobody could possibly be confused that they've hired the other guy when they've already hired this guy. Okay. Throw me out some questions about when you have to have a written brokerage agreement. Or you want me to test you. I didn't hear the last part. I think that there are agents out there artificially coming in with too high a number so that they end up with the listing. Oh, I see. And yeah, the question is uh, doing a CMA or a BPO for a, a seller to get a listing and inflating the dollars to uh, turn their head. Ugh. Yeah, well, the ML, I mean, the, the Code of Ethics is explicit about that. There's even a standard of practice that deals directly with that. The Real Estate Board will yank your ticket if they catch you doing that. Uh, and it's just downright evil, wicked, mean, bad, and nasty to uh, lie to a client about what you think the house is worth in order to benefit by having the client hire you. Um, I'm going to read between the lines. There was a reason that question is asked. I know why. You still see it happen. Okay, I know it. I hear this from time to time. Uh, just shun. I think it's very effective. This idea, let's just shun. Yeah, we won't sit next to them. <laughs> well, you know what? I've always said, I've always said <coughs> that if we won't police our own, <coughs> we give up the right to complain about the rotten apples in our midst. But you're absolutely right. It's life, too, life is too short. You know, and this is a big enough area that chances are good you might not run into them again or infrequently. But golly, you take neighborhoods like, say, Lexington, Virginia, or. Yeah, you take, you know, the Eastern Shore places on the Eastern Shore. Why would you tolerate in Accomack, where there are relatively few agents and you see them all the time, why would you tolerate somebody who was unethical and dishonest and hurt your business? Um, you can't avoid dealing with them. You know, Northern Virginia, you may never ever see that person again and your conscience is clean, somebody else's problem now. I don't know how that cleans your conscience. Um, all right, when you read this guidance document, um, and you notice that I never made a single reference to it, but now I, I, hope, I hope I don't need to, because if I had asked you to read this first, you would have come away scratching your head and saying, what is all this getting at? What is this getting at? Yeah. Um, but now, when you look at the, um, the definition of, um, of a brokerage, oh, by the way, let me tell you one thing to be cautious about. Uh, there was a fair amount of confusion, uh, or not necessarily confusion, but a little bit of a lack of clarity as to the interplay of customer and ministerial acts in the original draft of this, uh, which I think got cleaned up satisfactorily. Um, and it, but it leads me to an observation. One of the things that originally uh, some people had, had noted or, or suggested, or was in an original draft, I don't remember, was that if you did, see a customer, what is a customer? Somebody who has not hired us to, to enter into a brokerage relationship and for whom we provide activities that are ministerial in nature. In other words, and then the definition of that is those things that we can do without the exercise of independent judgment and uh, discretion, okay? Now, a customer is somebody who hasn't hired us, but for whom we do not provide acts that require us to use independent judgment and discretion. Can there be such a thing as a person who has not hired us, but does want us to provide actions that require the use of judgment and discretion. Yeah, what would we call that person? A prospect. 
a prospect who asks us to do things that are not just ministerial. So the question is, may you do things that require the use of judgment without a brokerage relationship? And the answer, I think, is clearly yes, if the intent has not yet been formed to hire you as required under the statute. In other words, you're not limited to things that don't require you to use your judgment. So one of the debates was, um, okay, um, they want you to show them property and they tell you that this is what they're looking for, three or four bedrooms, etc. Well, that requires you to use your judgment and discretion in deciding what fits their needs according to what they've told you. The answer to which, in my opinion, is, so what? There's nothing in the statute regarding brokerage relationships that, say, that says the only thing there is is a brokerage relationship and a customer relationship. <laughs> There may be another kind of relationship that's not a brokerage relationship. Customer, I think most of us are, have always thought, is the person that I find to buy my firm's listing, and they are not represented, and I'm not representing them. They're my customer. I can only do ministerial things for them. I can no longer give them judgment and discretion that could act against my client. That's the way customer dovetailed with brokerage relationships originally. But nothing in the statute says that you're either a client or a customer. Nothing. You can be this third category that isn't defined in the statute, but not prohibited either. A person who's not your client, but for whom you provide acts re requiring the use of discretion. All right. Now, there was an either or factor in here, and that was the thing I told you at the beginning. There were a few things that I thought needed to be addressed, and they were satisfactorily addressed. Um, but now when you read through this, and look at the, uh, and this is, this is where we'll stop because I know we're out of time. Below some are examples of situations require the, uh, uh, require the licensee to use judgment to determine the party's intent. Again, what is the idea here? What are they wanting here? What is their intent? Do they, are they intending now that I act to find them this deal in a, in a way that's a brokerage relationship? Um, many acts are mysterious, could be or could require a brokerage agreement. Showing a house may be ministerial. Again, I don't, I don't always agree with this focus on ministerial. I think it's a, you know, but could be ministerial if they take you to see features that are in the market. If the party asks the licensee to show him real estate because his intent is to have the licensee procure, blah, 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 blah. So I think the previous sentence is probably, un, it's irrelevant. It's true, but it doesn't go to the heart of whether you have to have a written agreement. That is always triggered by this idea that I'm hiring you to represent me in doing dealings with a seller or a buyer or whoever. All right, another example relates to a request for MLS search. Party asks for an MLS search without the intent to engage the person, um, then an agreement is not necessary. If you ask a search having the intent to engage them to procure a deal, then you have to have a written agreement. Okay? Um, there is a third page in there, yeah. Uh, let's see. If a party asks for general information, these are packs, uh, they appear to be ministerial. If they ask these questions because their intent is to have you represent them to find a deal, then yeah. Blah. So it's not the act. It's the act in the context of the purpose for which you're asked to do it by the consumer you're dealing with. Real quick. It's like you, you, your example of Ohio, they, we don't want to have an agent. Right. Just want to look. Or the person who comes in, calls you Thursday, says, we're transferring here. We need a house by the end of the day. That's Sunday. right. That, you will, you will, uh, often it'll be very clear. Sometimes it won't be clear. But the point is, you got to be looking for the right thing. Watch for the right thing. Wrong thing. I can show property without a broker's agreement. That's a wrong analysis. Sometimes you can. Sometimes you can't. You got it? Yeah. All right. Uh, as a further example, may provide marketing materials and a CMA to a prospective seller who's interviewing for a listing. Boy, they spent a lot of time pushing the board to put that in there. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would think that would be pretty obvious. You're, uh, you're, the seller is not hiring you before you sit down to get them to enter into a listing. I think that should be pretty clear. Anyway, it's there. Uh, I think the reason that that was asked for, believe it or not, I think it was asked for because there are lots of realtors who came to question based on the uh, instruction that was being given. How can I even do a CMA for a seller to do a listing presentation if you're telling me every licensed activity 
has to be done with a written agreement. I can't even do a listing presentation. That's the, con the amount of confusion that, that had been created. Okay. This doesn't answer all your questions. It, it helps you ask the right questions. Okay? Best I can do. All right. Thanks, guys.